In the last lesson you learned that the first sketch of a part has a node on the origin, and you can use the node to permanently constrain the location of geometry. You also learned that there are two types of snaps, soft snaps and hard snaps. The green snap dot makes a hard snap that is permanent, and the yellow snap dot makes a soft snap that is unconstrained. Now we're going to look at some of the other methods of drawing geometry using soft and hard snaps as well as permanent constraints. Click the line command. If you look in the status bar, you can see that it says to select the start of the line, and it also says that you can drag off the endpoint for tangent arc. We'll talk about the tangent arc later in the course. For now, I want you to select a point on the graphics area, and then select another point to draw a diagonal line. If you move your pointer around on the graphics area, you can see dotted lines that extend from existing geometry to the yellow snap dot. These locations are called inferred points and they define soft snap locations. You can also move your pointer to show automatic constraints. This is the perpendicular constraint. If you select this point, the new line will be perpendicularly constrained to the first line. You know the line will be perpendicularly constrained to the first line because the first line has the perpendicular constraint symbol next to it. Move your pointer until you can see an inferred location and the perpendicular constraint, and then click your left mouse button. Now type the escape key to exit line mode. The second line is constrained to the first line with a perpendicular constraint, but the end of the line was constrained with an inferred point. You can see how the line was constrained by dragging the node on the end of the line. The line stays perpendicularly constrained, but the location of the node on the end of the line can change. So inferred points are soft snap constraints. Now place your pointer on the line command in the ribbon. At the top left of the tooltip, you can see the name of the command, and to the right of the name is the letter L in parentheses. This indicates that the letter L is a command alias for the line command. Move your pointer into the graphics area, and then type the L key. Now that you're in line mode, select the end of the second line. The green snap dot is visible, so the lines will be permanently constrained together. When you're using automatic constraints, you can control which line is used for the constraint. As you can see by default, the perpendicular constraint will be added to the second line in the sketch. If you want to choose different base geometry for an automatic constraint, you can scrub the geometry you want to use. For example, if I wanted the third line to be parallel to the first line, I would scrub the first line with the pointer, and then draw the line. Notice that the parallel constraint is on the first line, and the pointer has the parallel constraint next to it. Another method of constraining geometry on a sketch is to use dimensions. If you place your pointer over the general dimension command, you can see that typing the D key can evoke the command. Click the command, or type the D key, and then place your pointer over the circle. The diameter symbol is next to the pointer, which indicates that you are creating a diametral dimension. Select the circle, and then select a point on the graphics area. When you do, a dimension box opens. Enter 94 thousandths of an inch, and then click the green check, or type the Enter key. Whenever you create a sketch, you need to be sure to fully constrain the sketch, and the best way to tell if the sketch is fully constrained is to look at the status bar. As you can see, six dimensions are required to fully constrain the sketch. Also notice that the color of the circle is changed to blue. This indicates that the circle is adequately constrained. You'll learn the difference between adequately constrained and fully constrained geometry later in the course. For now, notice that the lines are black, which means that they are not adequately constrained. You saw earlier that you can delete geometry by selecting it, and then typing the delete key. You can also drag a window around the geometry to select it. When you drag a window to the left, the geometry inside the window and the geometry the window crosses over is selected. When you drag the window to the right, only the geometry inside the window is selected. Use any method you prefer to highlight the lines, and then type the delete key to delete them. Now if you look in the status bar, the sketch is fully constrained. In the next lesson, you'll use this sketch to create a pin.
In this lesson you'll learn more about using the browser, how to use the extrude command to extrude a profile, how to set the view to the home view, how to pan, and how to use the view face command. First let's take a look at the browser. Since we haven't named the part, Inventor gave it the name part 1. You can see this name at the top of the browser and in the title bar. Below the name is the master view representation which we'll talk about later, and below that is the origin of the part. If you click the plus sign, the origin expands to show all three coordinate planes, the coordinate axes, and the center point. Below that you can see the sketch and the end of the list. When you add features to a part, the list in the browser will grow, so try to be aware of the list as it changes. We're in the sketch environment, and in order to extrude the circle, we need to be in the part modeling environment, so click the finish sketch command. Now that we're in the part modeling environment, we can extrude the circle. Click the extrude command. This opens the extrude dialog box and the mini toolbar. Expand the dialog box, and then move it to the upper left corner of the inventor window. You'll learn about the mini toolbar in the next lesson, so for now I want you to focus your attention on the extrude dialog box. At the top of the shape section is the profile selection button, and since you only have one profile, it's already been selected for you. If you had multiple profiles, you would click this button to select the profile. The output section is used to set the result of the extrusion operation to a solid or a surface. Leave the setting set to the solid option. The next section is the options section. Here you can set the extrusion to join, cut, intersect, or create a new solid. Since there is no other solid to cut or intersect, the top three options are grayed out. Leave the new solid option selected. Just to the right of the options section is the extend section. Here you can set the profile to extend a specific distance from its current location to another plane or face, or from one face or plane to another. Since there are no other faces or planes on this part yet, the only logical choice at this time is distance. You're going to extrude the circle one inch. To change the value, all you need to do is enter the value in the window. Leave the length of the extrusion set to one inch. Below the distance window are the directional icons. These icons allow you to choose from extruding in the positive Z direction, in the negative Z direction, symmetrically, or asymmetrically. If you choose symmetric, it will extrude half an inch in both directions, giving a net length of one inch. If you choose asymmetric, you can use different lengths for direction 1 and direction 2. Direction 1 is in the positive Z direction, and direction 2 is in the negative Z direction. We're going to extrude the profile 1 inch in the positive Z direction, so select this option, and then click OK. If you have a three button mouse, hold the middle button down to move the cylinder to any location on the screen. If you don't have a middle button, click the pan icon on the navigation bar, and then use your left mouse button to drag the cylinder to its new location. Once the cylinder is where you want it, type the escape key to exit the mode. Now let's look at the browser. Extrusion 1 has replaced Sketch 1. If you expand Extrusion 1, you'll see that Sketch 1 didn't actually disappear. It's now a subset of Extrusion 1. In other words, Sketch 1 has been consumed by Extrusion 1. One last thing before you end this lesson. To change the view back to a planner view, click the view face command located on the navigation bar, and then select the face on the cylinder. Now you're going to learn about the in canvas display. You'll learn more about the mini toolbar, and you'll learn a few methods of organizing and using dynamic input. We'll start by deleting extrusion 1 without deleting sketch 1. Right click on extrusion 1 and then select delete. This opens the delete features dialog box which gives you the option of deleting sketches consumed by the feature or leaving them intact. We want to keep the sketch so uncheck the box. I also want to point out that controlling the location of dialog boxes helps reduce eye strain. If you know where the dialog box is going to appear you won't have to search for it with your eyes and you'll really appreciate this after drafting for several hours so it's good practice to pick a location for dialog boxes. I always put dialog boxes in the upper left corner of the inventor window because they use less of the graphics area when they're here. So when you open a dialog box for the first time, move it to the upper left corner. In most cases, this is where it will appear the next time you use it. Click OK, and then open the extrude command. 
Notice that the dialog box opened in the same location as the last time we used it. Some of the feature commands, like the extrude command, allow you to use the in canvas display to dynamically control the geometry. When you use this method, the dialog box is usually collapsed, so go ahead and collapse it. Even if you decide to always use the in canvas display, having the dialog box in the upper left corner keeps it out of the way. So hopefully by the time you finish the courses, you'll have moved all the dialog boxes to the upper left corner. Now let's talk about the in canvas display. The in canvas display is the mini toolbar and the arrow and sphere. The arrow and sphere are called manipulators and they're used to dynamically adjust geometry. You can drag the arrow to adjust the length of the extrusion and notice that the mini toolbar moves along with the geometry. The purpose of this type of interface is to keep your focus on the feature while you adjust it and your eyes don't have to travel very far when you enter values in the toolbar. While you drag the arrow, the values in the toolbar snap to increments of a sixteenth of an inch. I'll show you how to set this setting in the next lesson. You can also drag the sphere to change the draft angle. This adjustment snaps every five degrees. Anytime you're dragging a manipulator, you can stop dragging it and type a value to precisely set it. So the fastest way to use these settings is to start the drag and then type the value. You can also type the tab key to toggle between the linear dimension and the angular dimension. Now would be a good time to practice using the manipulators and toggling between the draft angle and the length of the extrusion. And then in the next lesson I'll show you how to customize the toolbar.